Becoming a self-taught programmer. I feel like it's this mystery, like it's the million dollar question. It's so highly searched. People can't quite crack the code, so to speak. And honestly, I've watched a lot of people on YouTube talk about this, but I feel like the same advice is kind of given. Coming from somebody who is a self-taught programmer, it's not science or magic, but there is a method, a different method that I use that I found really helpful. Frankly, this video is probably geared towards all types of programmers, but the community that we're growing on this channel tends to swing towards self-teachers and digital DIYers. So no matter what background that you're coming from, feel free to jump on the bandwagon. All right, so let's jump into it. Here is the no BS guide on how to become a self-taught programmer. I'm gonna break this video down into six different steps, strategy, portfolio, studying, networking, applying, interviewing. All right, sick, let's do this. Let's talk about strategy. This is a fascinating topic because everyone and their mom is going to tell you that you need to stand out. You need to be some sort of technical messiah. Something on your portfolio has to be so, so eye-catching and completely different. Okay, I'm here to tell you that I disagree. Standing out is not the driving force of success that's going to land you that job. Rather than trying to stand out like aesthetically with your portfolio or having a bunch of accolades and certificates, you need to get your foot in the door, in the right door, into the third door. What's the third door? Here's a quote by Alex Binet to explain it. All highly successful people treat life business and success just like a nightclub there's always three ways in there's the first door where 99 percent of people wait in line hoping to get in there's the second door where billionaires and royalty slip through but then there's always always the third door it's the entrance where you have to jump out of line run down the alley climb over the dumpster bang on the door a hundred times crack open the door and sneak through the kitchen but there's always a way in whether it's how bill gates sold his first piece of software or how steven spielberg became the youngest director at a major studio in Hollywood, they all took the third door. So bringing this all back around, would you rather stand in a really long line, hoping that if and when you get noticed, somebody will notice you, or would you rather rely on tactical persistence, taking the third door? If it's the latter, then great, you're in luck. Your strategy is essentially going to be sheer will and pure stubbornness, thinking outside of the box. So I want you to keep this idea of the third door technique in the back of your head as we move on with the rest of the video. So let's now jump into the actual doing part of this process. So number one, we're gonna talk about your portfolio. The biggest thing that you need to understand about your portfolio is making sure that it is presentable, readable, professional, and organized. Again, going back to this third door strategy, the goal is not to create the most eye-catching, aesthetic, creative portfolio that anyone has ever seen. The goal is more so to create something that is clean, organized, professional, and presentable. There's a great example of a portfolio that I'll link in the description. I also made another video about this if you want to check it out. Okay, so what about the actual projects in said portfolio? How are you going to showcase your skills? Okay, so you should have at least two projects, I would say three max, and the projects are going to essentially follow the same line of thought that we've been using. Your goal here is to build a couple of simple things that showcase your skills in a presentable fashion. The project's features should obviously work as intended, and also you should not feel discouraged to add in your own personal flair. So maybe there's some new CSS trick that you just learned, go ahead and add it, why not? Just don't go over the top. The idea is not to create the next Netflix clone. I, I can't believe that people actually do that, especially for entry-level folks. Like you don't need to make a meta clone to showcase your skills properly. You can do that, but you really don't have to. Again, think simple. You have to learn to strip away the more, 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 more mentality. The internet likes to shove that down your throat. Additionally, your project should focus on the area of focus that you're trying to break into. So for me, it was front end development. So what I ended up doing was creating a couple of different projects that showcase my ability to write vanilla JavaScript code and also React code. So what I recommend is doing something like number one, building a vanilla JavaScript Asteroids game, which I'll link in the description, and number two, a web-based application, you know, built from React or some other cool framework. I also made another video about this if you wanna check that out, right here. 
All right, let's talk about studying. So a lot of people will tell you that you should study vertically, which basically translates to having a very large domain knowledge. So knowing a bunch of different things. I'm here to tell you that you should not. You should study only what you need to know to pass the interview. I repeat, study only what you need to know to pass the interview. You're going for strict and strong domain knowledge. How do you do that? Number one, you need to have a solid foundational understanding of the fundamentals and number two, you are going to interview and interviewing informs you of what it is you need to know to pass the interview. So let me break that down. Number one, having a foundational understanding. Foundational understanding is something like knowing how to write a for loop. Solidifying a simple concept like that is as simple as going onto YouTube or free code camp. You can basically look it up. And another thing that really used to help me early on, I would do a ridiculously simple tutorial. So something like a vanilla JavaScript to-do list. I would use a YouTube tutorial to essentially lean on. And the first go around, I would watch the tutorial and then I would complete the project with the instructor. Then after a few hours or after a day would go by, I would try to do the project by myself with as little help as possible until I got stuck and then I would refer back to the video. When you do that enough times over like a week or a week and a half period of times, you should be able to build a ridiculously simple project eventually without any help at all from the YouTube video. This is a great way to solidify foundational understanding. So once you have those foundationals down, you need to start failing interviews. Yes, you heard me correctly. You need to start failing interviews. I alluded to this earlier, but like I said, interviewing essentially informs you of what it is that you need to know to pass them. So you have to interview as much as possible. We'll cover this a little bit more in the interview portion of the video, but basically you have to go into interviews with the mindset that you are purely there to just gather information. So once you're done with that interview, for instance, in theory should know what you need to know to pass it. Now imagine doing that five times, 10 times, 20 times. Think about how much information you've accumulated. You'll use that as a basis to understand what you need to study to eventually pass that 21st interview. Remember, you're not in school anymore, so you don't get pinged or penalized or get a bad grade for failing one of these interviews. But wait, how do you go about actually getting these interviews? Arguably the most important factor, especially when you're first starting out, and trying to get your first job as a self-taught programmer is going to be networking. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how you should network. Assuming that you know little to nobody in the industry, what you're going to do is reach out to at least one person per week who works in the tech industry or has worked in the tech industry or whatever it is to any capacity is involved in tech. You're going to ask them if you can buy them a coffee and pick their brain about what they do or what they did or what their current role is or what their company does. If you don't feel comfortable about asking somebody to get a coffee with you, then you can ask them to do like a 10 minute Zoom or a 10 minute phone call. If you don't wanna do that and you wanna just start out by doing something even easier, you can ask somebody if you can send them a few brief questions on LinkedIn or something or on email. The point is to cast a super wide net and make it really easy for people to say yes. Okay, here's an important note that I need to share with you. At any point before, during, or after the conversation, you are not going to ask for a referral. I cannot stand that people still do this. It's amazing to me. Do not ask for a referral. It comes off as expectant and ingenuine. People are not stupid. They know what you want. So you, you have to at least act a little bit interested in what that person does or what their company does. And people really like to talk about themselves. So take advantage of that, be interested in them. And trust me, when people see that you're interested in them, they'll a lot of times wanna be interested in you. And that's when the referral comes in play. A lot of times people just wanna help you. Trust me, it works. You may not get it every single time, but if you do go into the conversation with little to no expectations, you'll probably get what you want more likely than not. If by the end of this conversation, if said person does not give you a referral, which again is totally okay and it's not expected, then what you should do is essentially ask them if there is someone else in their company or within their greater network that they could kindly connect you with so that you could then pick their brain and learn more information on what they do or what they do within their company or in their specific industry within tech. So you can basically be curious about their life. Nine out of 10 times people will say yes to this request because again, people just wanna help, especially if you come off as genuine. Remember, persistence is key here. We're done waiting around in line. While everybody else is, we've already jumped out of line, walked around to the side of building and started shattering all the windows. If you do this enough times, you'll begin to get referrals. Referrals help to bypass a lot of that 
initial work in the application process that everybody kind of just hates. All right, so now let's talk about applying. So there's this whole argument about quality versus quantity, quantity versus quality. This is my take on it. If you were to tell me that you are sending out 100 LinkedIn quick apply applications a day, hoping that you're gonna get a job interview, I would for the most part disagree with that approach. It's not that it's not okay, but I think that there's a stronger way to do it. I'd say that you are probably waiting in the really long line, hoping to just get noticed. If you're applying to one or two jobs a week, mainly just focusing on the strength of your cover letter, your CV, your resume, blah, blah, blah. I'd say that you're spending far too much time on one or two opportunities and you need to blast out way more applications. So what you're going to do is find a happy medium. Every single Sunday, I would scour LinkedIn and Indeed and find seven to 10 jobs, let's say, that I felt like I really wanted and I wanted a gun for. I'd make it a goal that every day throughout that next week, I would send at least one meaningful application to one job out of that list. In tandem, I'd send out a few more applications per day on top of that meaningful application, just not as meaningfully. So maybe that's using like LinkedIn Quick Apply or just applying regularly, but just not putting as much effort into it. You're gonna have to just experiment as much as you can to figure out what it is that works for you and your schedule. All right, so you're finally getting interviews by way of applying, networking, combination of both, I hope. I discussed this earlier in this video. Interviewing for technical positions especially is quite unique because you can use them as a way to inform you about what it is that you need to know to actually pass them. So your mentality going into interviews is purely that of information gathering. Every interview that you're in, you're going to use as a practice round for the next interview with the next company that you're in. I talk about this a little bit more in one of my videos, but basically you have to pretend like you are a fly on the wall, that you're kind of just watching, observing, seeing what happens, being present in the moment, and enjoying the process. Because again, the mentality is that you are gathering information in this current information gathering session so that you can have more information for the next information gathering session. As a byproduct, you will be much more relaxed, which will likely result in a better performance. And actually this makes the experience better for the interviewer too, which is great because you wanna leave a good impression. The reason why it's better for the interviewer is because Think about it, so many candidates go into interviews, especially entry-level interviews, overly eager, cocky, overly confident. Who wants to interview somebody like that? As I mentioned earlier, you kind of have to go through this process like several times, like 10 plus times, 20 plus times. And eventually you just start to get better at it. You begin to improve at like, letting it all just go. And that's why it's so important to just interview a ton. Keep interviewing, always interview. Again, this is the no BS guide. So a lot of this just comes down to luck, persistence, and preparation as best as you can. And in the craze of these interviews, one day something happens. You get a call back or a final round interview. But even when you're in a final round interview, you have to continue to keep interviewing. And I'll tell you why, because we derive confidence from our options. And it's the basis of an abundance mindset. So treat it all the same as best you can. And I know that's difficult, no matter what stage you are in the interview process. And one day, one of these companies will call you back after a final round interview and I'll give you an offer. And guess what? It's gonna be a glorious day. And you know why? Because you had the guts to jump out of your place in line, bypass all the folks in it, ahead of you and behind you, run around the side of the proverbial programming job success building, smash through each window, each door with persistence and integrity until finally one opens and you jump right through it. Wow, that closer was so memorable. <laughs> Anyways, thank you for joining me today. I'm confident that this no BS guy will help you land a job as a self-taught programmer. I really tried to lay it out as clearly and as organized as possible. So if you found yourself at the end of this video, special thanks to you for sticking it out. As always, hit that subscribe button if you like the content and obviously give this video a like. And I would love to hear from you. So feel free to drop a comment or a question below. Also, let me know what you want the next video to be about. I'd love to hear it. Until next time, peace.